tonight, we have a very exciting agenda for this evening. As you all know, Professor Yossi Shane, who heads the Hartog School of Government at Tel Aviv University, and he's also on faculty at the Department of Government at Georgetown University, is here to give us a brief presentation about the essential elements in his very exciting cutting-edge book, This Kinship and Diasporas in International Affairs. But he will be doing a book signing after the event, and we have a little reception uh, that will take place afterwards. So I encourage you to buy a copy of the book, which is half off the retail price uh, tonight. It's a very interesting book, a very interesting take, but also spent some time uh, speaking with uh, Professor Shane. Uh, we also have uh, Professor Manuel Orozco sitting in our back, uh, back of, the, of the room. I, I also point him out because he is one of the leading world experts on remittances, those money transfers that diasporas make to their home countries. And so this is a great opportunity for the GW community, I think, to have a chance to mingle and, and uh, learn from two of the world's experts on, uh, on these topics. I want to thank a couple of, of wonderful organizations that have sponsored this event tonight. First and foremost, I'd like uh, to thank the Center for International Business Education and Research uh, that has provided funding for this event. Uh, and I'll have uh, the director come and speak to you in just a minute to give you a little bit of an overview about our center. And then also I'd like to thank ISIC, a fantastic student organization here, and I know the president is here also to tell you a little bit about that uh, organization as well. So. Without further ado, uh, Director Pradeep Rao from the Center for International Business Education and Research. Thank you, Lisa. Good evening. Um, this event, as uh, Lisa mentioned, is jointly sponsored by GW Cyber and the ISEC group, and Amanda will be up here to say a few words in a moment. But let me welcome you all. Um, cyber, as you might know, is uh, one of 30 one cybers around the country. It's um, a center that was established by an act of Congress in the late 80s under Title VI. And what we do is uh, basically uh, focus on activities designed to help improve U.S. business competitiveness. That's the charge that Congress gave to us. And under that, we do a number of things, including events like this evening's uh, talk by Professor Shane. And uh, we um, also do curricular um, initiatives and languages. Uh, if you are interested in knowing more about cyber, I couldn't tell you everything that's happening in cyber in the next few minutes. And if I talk any longer, I'll be taking more time from Professor Shane. So uh, please do come and talk with us, and we will tell you much more about what's happening at GW Cyber. Uh, Professor Shane, as you know, is uh, an expert in this uh, area. and. Uh, the diaspora area, which uh, is also one of our areas of focus in cyber. And I can tell you that you will have a very interesting evening with him because I heard him speak on National Public Radio with uh, our other friend Manuel Orozco there uh, last week, or a week before last, and I was very impressed with uh, that interview. I enjoyed it. I was lucky to be in the car when it was happening, so I, I caught it by accident, actually. But, we were, we were uh, hoping there would be traffic jam, so everybody. Well, there was a traffic jam, and I heard most of it, and so it was very interesting. So I'm looking. I mean, you will be looking forward. Unfortunately, I can't stay but a few minutes because I have a class. But I heard Professor Shane speak at lunch today at a panel, and uh, he's a very interesting speaker. We also have Professor Binkerhoff, who is uh, from our GW Cyber, working with the diaspora area along with Lisa Riddle. So uh, we have. Uh, <coughs> Uh, as I said, uh, many people interested in this topic, and as a member of the diaspora myself, an increasingly visible diaspora in the United States, um, I think it's a, a very fine uh, area to focus on in GW Cyber. So with that, let me pass this on to Amanda, and she'll say something about ISEC, which is the student organization. I'm Amanda Brown, and I'm the president of a student organization on campus called ISEC. We are actually one of the world's largest student-based organizations. We're in over 100 countries. And our main focus is uh, promoting cross-cultural understanding through exchange. So we send students to work at internships abroad, and we also work to bring students from those other countries to work at internships here in the U.S. We actually just had um, an Egyptian intern from who's interning with PricewaterhouseCoopers in Boston and come down for the weekend and we showed him around DC. Um, but it's a really great, great organization and it's a great way to get involved. We're also about developing leadership and potential. 
Um, and so we have a lot of students doing a lot of things hands-on to keep the organization running and working both at a local and a national level. So um, we'll be here. There's flyers. Uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask us or other members in the, in the audience. So feel free to ask them as well. But yeah, thank you. Great, sir. Thank Please. you so much. Thank you so much for coming tonight, and uh, thank you for the kind introduction and for the day uh, here at uh, GW. We have a beautiful uh, ambiance here, a beautiful building, and uh, some very fine people here doing some interesting work. Um, I would like to say a few words about my work in this field, about the potential in developing and thinking about these subjects. Um, and um, perhaps reading to you a few lines from the work. Um, and um, uh, certainly we'll be delighted to take your questions. I see here a lot of young faces, as I like, you know, students, I assume. Um, this subject is certainly the subject of diaspora and kinship, I believe, especially in, in today's world when students are traveling to many countries. Um, and many students from abroad are coming to this country, as they have been for some time, uh, is, is, uh, is an important one. It has numerous dimensions to it. And I, in particular, began thinking about the subject also when I was a student many, many years ago. I came to this country as a foreign student. I barely spoke a word of English. And I um, uh, was really uh, gradually uh, came to... Uh, appreciate the opportunity which was given to me um, in this country and, and became avid, I would say, almost addicted to its culture and to the, um, the, uh, the variety, the hybridity of cultures that were created here and really was, try was trying to understand lots of the things that I've seen here and take it to where I came from, which is from Israel. Um, it is very interesting for me, this is kind of like uh, uh, already uh, too many years, uh, about 25 years which I've been uh, in, this, in this business, um, when I landed in, in the shores of uh, um, in, in New York more or less and, and I went to school at Yale and I uh, started to think about lots of issues things that I've never been exposed to before. Um, I, the first subject that I started to think about, I came with ideas from home. And I brought with me lots of ideas from home for my own existence. But also realized quite quickly that I want not to forget the home, but really want to become as an intellectual away from home, create a different ways of thinking about issues in the world that eventually also led me back to home to think about the home. So this was quite a journey for me in that respect. For years, I've refrained from writing about my home country. I've refrained about writing about my ethno-religious identity as a Jewish scholar because I never wanted to be sort of like identify with it or to be kind of caught in the web of some of these issues. But over the years, of course, my own experiences, my own life experiences, my own sort of an understanding of issues started to inform my other uh, uh, research and writing about it. So it came all about, in fact, one day when I discovered in the Beinecke Library, which is a very old library at Yale, an archive. And I spoke to a scholar, a very prominent scholar of Zionism, and a very prominent historian named David Vital, who has written really the definitive work on the history of Zionism. I said, look, I discovered the things about this group, Jewish group, that just in 1940, when the uh, European Jewry was in the midst of the beginning of the horror of the, of the World War II and the Holocaust, uh, starting to campaign in the United States and trying to mobilize people to the issue when no one spoke about it. And they were completely outside the fray of also of that that point, much less, but yet starting to be organized American Jewry. Um, and that group uh, was led by a, a guy named Peter Bergson. 
that was a name that he adopted as, uh, uh, um, as an organization man. He was working for that, at that point for the revisionist Zionism, which emerged in Eastern Europe and landed in Palestine, but they landed in the United States. And they decided they must do something against even the administration and the official, um, I would say, leadership of the Jewish community. They didn't want to make noises. Noises were not good. To make noise, who can make noise? And he created this committee for saving the Jewry in Europe. And I knew the man. I knew the man. He lived in Israel. I knew the man because I was in love with his uh, daughter <laughs> at the time. And I said, wow, this is incredible. And I went to see him, and we started to talk. And we had many, many hours of talks, and I interviewed him about all this activity. And then, I, you know, when I saw this whole archives at, at, at Yale, I started to read. It's beautiful to read archives, you know. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to get into the archive with any of your materials. You're not allowed even to bring a pencil at that time. Where the, the, God forbid you're going to write about one of these documents. But you start to read documents and documents and documents and exchanges how suddenly someone writes to the president of the United States, to the Congress, and, and you know, no one knew about them, and organizing rallies in New York uh, uh, to put this issue on the agenda, not that so many people listened, but still created some stir. And I said to my professor, David Vital, at the time, I said, wow, this is quite remarkable, this is interesting. And he said to me, this is Luft politics. Politics in the air means nothing, just puff. And I said, do you have any um, sort of like other examples of that. He said, you know, interesting enough, I think it's kind of like reminiscent of the Spanish Republicans. I said, Spanish Republicans? Never heard of them. You know, I was a student, and so I started to look about Spanish Republicans. And you know, the Spanish Republicans, of course, were the outcome of the Civil War. There was a government in Spain, and the Civil War in Spain between 1936 and 1939 uh, the government of Prieto and Azania collapsed, and they left to Mexico. And they left to Mexico and started to do politics in order to regain power in their countries of origin from far away, with all sorts of intellectual discoveries, intellectual centers, to unseat Franco. So I started to study the, uh, this group. Interesting enough, it was my second year in graduate school. I started to read all the books that I could put my hand on in the Spanish Republicans. And that kind of like started to take me to other groups, took me to the Russian whites, started to discover sort of the whole politics of the Russian whites, those who were uh, defeated by, of course, by the communist revolution and came to this uh, uh, country some, but also to Europe. And you see all sort of claimants to power, the Grand Duke this, the Grand Duke that. So I traveled to Paris, I started to look at documents. It was fascinating. And this kind of led me to start to think about this politics of exiles. I was enchanted by the notion of the politics of exiles. And as a student, I came to another professor of mine, who was a prominent professor at the time. His name was David Apter, very prominent social scientist. And he said, I want to write about the politics of exiles. I said, excuse me, which group are you going to talk about? I said, I'm not going to talk about any group. I'm going to talk about the phenomena. And he said, Huh, this young man has a guts. What do you mean a phenomenon? What do you know about this phenomenon? So I'm going to start to ask theoretical questions about it. It's interesting to me. I suspect that you see one group, you see lots of many other groups. You see lots of things happening. And in three hours of conversation, it came to be that I knew he is not my advisor. <laughs> I was at the time a student of political philosophy. I started to read Rousseau. I was about to write a dissertation on Rousseau. And Jean Baudin, I was like in, immersed in political philosophy for years. But this issue caught my imagination and I said, maybe I'll make a switch. So I went to see another teacher. And the other teacher's name is Juan Linz. Juan Linz was a prominent political scientist. I had several good prominent political scientists at the time at Yale. Robert Dahl was my other advisor. And I started to talk to him. And I said to him, you know, I read about the Spanish Republican and he's from Spain. Boom. Oh, good, good subject. And he, when you ask him a question, he talks for three hours, and I listen this time. And for, talk to me about the subject, and so on. And I said, you know, you and Robert Dow wrote this old books about governments in opposition, but none of which mentioned that there are opposition from abroad. None of which. 
It's never opposition from abroad, but there are many opposition from abroad. To make a long story short, he said to me, so uh, what do you suggest? He said, I'm going to study the phenomena. He said, then when do you have to submit it for, uh, because there was an SSRC grant. I said, you know, I, I, I will not make it this time because the deadline is this coming Monday. It was on Friday. I said, no, no, you can make it. Just work this weekend and I will approve it. I said, what, you're going to approve my, my dissertation proposal in two days? He said, I don't care about your proposal. I'm going to grade your dissertation, not your proposal. And lo and behold, that's exactly how it happened. I wrote the proposal six pages in one day. I gave it to him. He said, of course, he will change everything later on. I approve. <laughs> and um, I always found this very innovative approach. Let's apply for money, which I got, and I started to work. And interestingly enough, I became immersed in the study of the politics of exiles. And exiles, at the time, there was not even one book written, only case studies. And I said to myself, wow, this raises so many questions. And that began my journey. I switched from political theory at that Monday to comparative politics, and I had to take all the classes from the beginning, international relations and comparative politics. And I was, if I may brag, I mean, I was incredibly gratified when I finished my dissertation. I won the best dissertation award in international relations, even though I took my first international relations course when I started my dissertation. Because this issue was never touched, not because I was a genius. It was really, it fell between the national and the international spheres. Groups which were outside the state but doing politics both in the international realm and the domestic arena. And brought tremendous questions into my mind about how the international politics works and also how domestic politics on the issue of belonging and sovereignty and citizenship and loyalty started to inform our understanding. When this work was finished and published at the same time, because I was and I suggested always to my students, don't write papers, write books immediately and send them, don't tell them you're a student. I went and I said, this is an interesting phenomena, this phenomena, the world is starting to crumble, the post-communist world is starting to emerge. And I said, what question did I ask? I asked a question about opposition from abroad, and opposition from abroad against a home native regime. When you fight against a home native regime, you don't challenge your state, or you don't challenge your boundaries. You challenge rather the legitimacy of the government at home to govern. You are a contestant for power. And that has tremendous ramification. That led me to think about what other possibilities are there. And the other possibilities I found, of course, were governments in exiles, which were not fighting against the home native regime, but many governments in exiles in the third world and other places which came to unseat colonial regimes or those who came to unseat occupation. <coughs> they don't have the same dilemmas. They don't deal with the government at home about questions of loyalty, belonging. They all belong to a different arena. But yet they have similar issues. Host states, where are they located, who financed them, the international arena, the question of recognition in international relations and international law. All these questions started to inform my own understanding. So I wrote another book called Government in Exile and Contemporary War Politics. <clears throat> As I thought about it, it became clear during these two works that there is a very important room for those who are not exiles and are not politically aspirants, but those who are what we call diasporas. And I defined them at the time in 1987, people who regard themselves or regard by others as members or potential members of the countries of origin regardless of the citizenship status or their place of residence. They are mobilized as such to give support to claims to power at home or abroad or to other issues. These are the people. They are mobilized. They may be completely naturalized citizens in another country. They are far away from the countries of origin, but they have a stake somehow. And why do they have a stake? This kind of issue took you to lots of other directions because at the time, if you remember in the early 90s, there was a debate going on in America. You were very young, so you don't remember. <laughs> I always talk to students and I forget you don't remember early 90s. You don't remember the collapse of the Soviet Union because it's kind of like a collective memory of the old, uh, which is remarkable because of only yesterday. But in the 90s, there was a big debate emerging in America about multiculturalism and about how this country is confusing 
the issue of its identities, people on the left, people on the right, people claiming that the idea of recognizing groups is undermining American civil culture. The whole debate about the liberal creed of this country was debated. The whole issue that was related at the time also to African Americans emerging as a group in the, in the late 80s with the issue of South Africa. Lots of issues pertaining to civic culture in this country. And people wanted to be defined with the life abroad, with ethnicity. An issue that always existed in America, but got on a different level in the late 80s, early 90s, when ethnicity became more and more respectable. When people decided that the world has changed, it opened up, it's kind of a cosmopolitan world. And this issue led me to think a lot about ethnicity in the United States on a variety of issues. Issues pertaining to civic culture, issues pertaining to education, issues pertaining to domestic politics, involvement of Americans in their, uh, the life of Congress, etc., etc. But it came to me as, 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 a, as a thought that this also has to have repercussions in the international arena. Because people who define themselves with the mother country, regardless of the fact that they've been here for many years, sometimes are awakened to this identity. You know, the whole idea of Herberg that the second and third generation want to remember what the first generation wanted to forget. Suddenly awakening to such ideas. I saw lots of explosions of identities because of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the emergence of democracies around the world. <clears throat> people from any place you would just think who have not had any connection with their mother country suddenly becoming mobilized in favor of democratization in their countries of origin or symbolic homeland. And this was a very enlightening phenomenon <clears throat> on ethnicity in America, how it has an international component. And that international component led me to think about the whole gamut of this diaspora politics in America. And that was what led me eventually to develop my thinking uh, in a variety of articles and then with a book called Marketing the American Creeds Abroad. And the American Creed Abroad, Marketing the American Creed Abroad, I made a point, a small point, but kind of like create controversy. It's always good to have to be controversial. When I said against the argument the people in America's relations with the countries of origin is eroding American civic culture and eroding the cohesion of this society as Huntington and others make claims, etc. I make the claim that the more people are involved in the countries of origin as Americans, the more likely they are to be Americanized, the more likely they are to be empowered in this country, and the more likely they are to export American values abroad. And that kind of like it was a thesis of sorts. I was sitting at the time, started to think about Mexico, and you never know where you sit. When I met the Mexican ambassador at the time, uh, 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 Rosenthal, uh, came to London. I met, in London, I met Rosenthal, and then I went to Mexico only after that, etc. In many cases, and I started to talk with Arabs, etc. And I started to think about what happened here, and that was what led me to that book which dealt with the variety of issues of Americans relating to their countries of origin and how it impacts American civic culture, American foreign policy, and the whole debate on the, on the question of national interest and how it <coughs> happened since the 19th century. Now, it is clear that this subject has become a very important subject. And I remember also in the late 80s when a friend of mine called me and said, look, why don't we create a journal called Diaspora? And I said, that's a good idea, let's do it. Um, at the time, very few were interested. The Journal of Diaspora, the Journal of Transnational Studies, which we established in 1988-89, um, suddenly the subject became important. And we were very grateful that lots and lots of people understand the gravity and the importance. And of course, there are so many facets that so many important scholars started to touch. And, so, but I started to think more and more about, also, as I said, coming back, for me, what does it mean? I became, in many respect, being in America, I not only was an Israeli anymore, I became more Jewish than I knew. It's always the case, you go abroad and you get an identity. You know, it's always for ethnicity. You find lots of ethnic groups who came to this country and discover their identity only when they left. I didn't know, you know. I, I was not versed with the nuances 
I never in my life attended a synagogue when I lived in Israel. I didn't need to. I'm an Israeli. I'm a secular Israeli, like the majority of Israelis. But when you come here, what are you going to do at the holidays? No one inviting you. So you go to the synagogue, you start to learn the prayer. You make some money as a graduate student teaching Sunday school, so I had to learn the prayers. <laughs> and uh, that's exactly how it was. And that kind of like started to interest me. And I looked at this and I said, this is a paradigmatic case. The Jewish case is a paradigmatic case. And it came back and I, I think I also became more confident as a scholar to start to talk about my own. And indeed, that kind of led me to my own personal changes. I was completely Americanized in that sense. I got married with an American lovely lady. I had my American kids. Everything was in place. But I had my homeland missing constantly in my mind. Eventually, I kind of bifurcated my life. I teach one semester there, one semester here for the last nine years, and even before. But I needed it. This is something which was, the attachment was so strong, undeniably strong. Things which were cultivated in my concept of who I am, what I am, not as a debate about, about myself as psychological matters. I'm very, I'm prone to, to psychological matters. I'm very sort of like a, a, a real life guy. But nevertheless, I allowed myself to be more preoccupied with these issues and became much more interested in this culture and the development and the emerging of the nation state and what happened. Because it became clear to me that the nation state was not a modern phenomenon. But very few have talked about the nation state not as a modern phenomenon. The entire gamut of scholarship on the nation state is about the nation state as a modern phenomenon because it was built with the notion of self-determination. Self-determination is a modern concept. It was enlarged from the individual to the community. And therefore, nations deserve self-determination. But this concept was very much already with the people of Israel in the old days. Nowadays, interesting enough, this is how scholarship often moves. Suddenly you see five or six major, major important books about how nationalism is an old phenomenon, the whole old and debating major, major, the first world, the, the endurance of nationalism and Anthony Smith, all these great guys who have written major works to show that there is the longevity of the concept of nationalism from antiquity to modernity. And that kind of like led me to start to think about a lot of issues, and they were disjointed about these influences of the broad at home on the international system in particular, and how does it impact our thinking about international relation theory. As I told you, I knew very little about international relations theory, even after I graduated. And a very good student at Georgetown who started to teach me, took his comprehensive, always go for those who are studying the comps. Com because they study, they have to study. It's the last time people will study like that. No one study after they graduate. <laughs> you, are, you are laughing, but it's true. You spend more time than you want to know about the books, the books, the books. And, and I, I always say, okay, you read them and you teach me. I now have a son who is a freshman at Georgetown. And I steal from him his books. So, where's my book, Daddy? I come to see you. you know, I, I bother him. I said, no, I just want to see what you're studying. Because usually the, the, the young generation is on the cutting edge, starting to think afresh, not yet tainted by our scholarship. I always love this sort of like the students coming and asking this question that supposedly are, are not sophisticated, but they're the most sophisticated because they're to the point, not with any jargon and any, just like let's think clearly about these issues, clean. And I started to think about these issues. And it's clear in my mind, and with so much study, so many studies, other studies started to emerge, that these are important issues. In finance, today we talked about it. I started to think a lot about this sort of the, 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 the capital flow. What does it do? And how does it inform our national identity? I developed this whole model about not just like the remittances issues, which are so important here, but how much money is given to ideological issues in order to inform and change identity, and what does it mean to the point of identity. What types of identity do we mean? And, and that kind of led me to write theories about national identity. Because, for example, I discovered that money that moves to the homeland is moving into three trajectories, either to state building, or to the political arena, or to the perception of the nation international relations. These are three axles. So immediately I said, wow, look at this. And that kind of, from this field, I started to write theories about international relation theory. And that's what this book is all about. It's about international relation theory via the diaspora. The diaspora is always a vehicle to think about these issues and about nationalism. So let me just read you a few, pa few paragraphs, not a lot. Un 
undoubtedly, modern nationalism, the idea that people with distinct characteristics should have the right to govern themselves in a territory, believed to be their homeland, is tied to the Enlightenment and to the evolution of the modern state since the 18th century. Yet, the concept of ethnicity, kinship, and the ties between the land and the people predate modern nationalism, going back much further. In the Jewish case, the Israelites under the United Davidic Kingdom saw the land from Dan to Beersheba as a patrimony of God to his people. The biblical nation therefore, is a form of kinship signifying recognition of being territorially related. As such, it posits the criteria of birth for membership that places the nation within the continuum of forms of kinship. The recognition of kinship also implies possession and sovereignty over the land. That's a quote from Crosby. And yet, for many generations, the idea of returning to the promised land was mostly a traditional myth related to the Jewish covenant with God. In reality, prior to modern Zionism, none dared and few greater, greatly desired to subject the matter of the return to the promised land to pragmatic or even philosophic examination. It was the case, too, that for many centuries there was nothing in the actual condition of the Jews that especially impelled or encouraged many of them to do so. Let me jump here. In many cases, Membership is attributed by birth rather than earned or chosen. Certainly religion, nationality, and even class are not fully chosen. Race is even more primordial. Yet identities and kinship bonds are also liable to shift according to politics and freedom of choice. Power structures in particular have tremendous impact on the definition of group membership, loyalty, and obligation. Just as inborn identity and kinship ties often defy political boundaries, political structures, and in particular sovereign power, which constantly redefine nascent identity. This process confuses the alleged division of humanity by providence with the ever-changing design of humans. Where did I discover that? When I read the Federalist Papers. In Federalist Papers, you see John Jay, and they talk about on two things They started to inform me on one issue that I saw about blood shared, and the other is blood spilt. You are born as if there is blood bond between people, but when there is more blood bond than in war, as Shakespeare writes about them, band of brethren. So this notion of blood shared versus blood spilt really intrigued me. That identities are formed not only by ancestry, but also by war. And for the Jewish case, it was always the case. The Jews, for example, in Germany, when Hitler came to power, I found this manuscript, interesting manuscript, that the Jews came to, to show this Third Reich, to tell the Germans, look, we died more than anyone else during World War I. We spilled blood. We were more loyal. Two to one soldiers died. And we have more medals of honor from Germany. And that is our entitlement. It didn't, it didn't matter. But this issue really struck me. And it struck me both in the case of Israel, when Russian migrants coming to Israel, and they are not Jewish. Can they get citizenship or not? And then Prime Minister Sharon hosts them for the Passover holiday and say, I don't care whether the rabbis say you're Jewish or not. You are the most Jews we have here. Because you fight as soldiers. You give yourself to the country. So this notion of who belongs to where is really intriguing. And the diaspora is a very interesting case. Because they are situated, as I said today in my lecture, outside the state, but inside the nation. A nation is constantly wrestling with that. And that has repercussions. It has repercussions in the international sphere, in economics, as we know. It has repercussions, tremendous repercussions, in religion. And I study here in the book our religious values and religious ideas and religious beliefs are nourished in the diaspora, are transmitted to the country of origins and vice versa. This, are, this is not at all a simple case. And it is incredibly important in conflict resolution. Because conflict resolution on issues pertaining to homelands always involve communities that reside far away from the homeland. There is, then I saw this study by the World Bank, Collier study. And I said, Kaliji, 
first of all, studies, I don't think it's a great study, but nevertheless, Collier comes with this quote saying, there is no other explanatory variable to the continuation of civil wars around the world, six times more than any other variable, than the work of diaspora. Obviously, I was already writing at that time on the issue of conflict resolution because trying to explain why diasporas are impacting conflicts, why they're interested, how they define themselves as part of the conflict, how conflict impact collective memory, how conflict impact their status abroad, even though they reside abroad full-fledged citizens, how they mobilize. You look at the Indian community part, they've just left. Today we talked about, I think, uh, Liz will talk about bonds. The whole bond industry became part of India's life. India raised over two weeks, $4 billion, when India fought with the international community on the issue of the nuclear power. So I started to look at all of these issues as part of an international system conflict as well. The book deals, each chapter deals with such issues, with finance, religion, conflict, gives it its due. And finally, what I was trying to do is to try to say, okay, so what have we learned in international relations? International relations, you all take perhaps course introduction to international relations, and what you find? You find several theories always. Realist approach, the liberal approach, and the constructivist approach. I never understood them fully, but fine. <laughs> so many books and every book again and again and again digest them. And I said, okay, I have to make a dent in this business as well. And that's where I bought my essay for international organizations. Think, look, we have a group here, which is outside the state but inside the nation. And they are involved in what I call the third level game of politics, a la Patna, but even more so. They are, their politics is not that what they call interests create identities. But their mere interest is identities. And let's see how it works. There are outside constituency, but they are also considered domestic constituency. Their identities are shaped. And I made some dense and discussion about international relations and why diaspora can enrich us in discussing international relations theory. Now, all of this, of course, has two levels. One is the scholarly level, which we are all in universities, and I highly recommend. It's still, this is our pursuit, to be scholars and to be quoted and to write books with footnotes. But even more so <laughs> is the excitement about some of these issues. That if you want to and if you are talented, which I'm not with the language, I have some, but not a lot, because I always struggle with the language, even though I've acquired this language, but it's not my language. I always say, my language. When I have to write something quickly in Hebrew, shh, in a second I'll write it. But in English, I still take my time. Even though I've written books now for 20 years, but it's a different type of attachment to language. So uh, what I can recommend only to the young people here, as well as to the more established, that just enjoy this craft, that you find really something that is interesting. This subject can take you for a long time, and it can create, and I constantly look for new frontiers of this. Uh, you all know, you know, like there's lots of debates in the political arena, now there was the Mirsheim and Walt book about the Jewish uh, power conspiracy in the world and how America cannot do anything because the Jews have subverted, uh, which I, I think quite misunderstanding at all how American politics works. And, 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 but this is good stuff to, to start to wrestle with, to debate, to debunk. Uh, there's so much stuff out there in this field. And each of the subjects requires tremendous amount in, of innovation, and I know Lots of the people, some sitting here, are touching upon it. The interesting thing about it, I think, from my point of view, that even though there are so many numerous examples, is how we as theoreticians can always bring it to the fore and say, this is a phenomenon. We have identi identified a phenomenon. And a phenomenon may have multiple dimensions. And this is exactly why I took the Jewish case as what I call a paradigmatic case. It's paradigmatic in the sense that it covers numerous dimensions of the phenomena. There are many other cases which are similar and covering many, but this is because of the longevity of history, because of, of, of the, the multiplicity of activities, because of the dispersion all around, really gives you kind of a case which you can also compare to other cases as a paradigmatic case theoretically. And indeed, both in terms of theory and in terms of practice, it has been a case for many to study and elaborate 
and that's why I adopted it back to myself as someone who grew up and became sort of enchanted by my own existence in two countries with my Jewish identity which was late, lately was acquired and with my own sort of like intellectual discovery both about Israel and the Jewish world and that is kind of like the outcome of this book and um, I hope that uh, you make sense of it it's not something that you want to take to you to, with you to bed to read uh, you want to take People's Magazine uh, other good stuff to put you to sleep. This will put you to sleep too quickly. <laughs> uh, but it's certainly something that you want to ponder theoretically and otherwise with the cases and the information which is there uh, if you want to start and further develop or compare cases and, and develop theory. So this is the message. Thank you. Thank you. If you have any yeah. questions, I'll be receptive. <laughs> yes, sir. I have a question and, and a comment. I'll start with the comment first. But, um, it was interesting that you talked about conflict, conflict resolution, because as an Israeli yeah. uh, myself, uh, I've noticed, I've, I've had more, I have more Arab and Palestinian friends in yeah. D.C. than I've ever had in my, my whole entire life. In yes. And, and when, in, in talking to them, um, you know, when in, in Israel it's harder to talk because of that pressure that, that, that feeling that of, of pressure all the time, and, and, the, and the reality that you have to, you have to go through. And, 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 and here, the Palestinians feel like they can talk and they can flip the reality of Israel aside and, and, and talk about human beings. And we were able to also find a lot of more, a lot more in common. Mm -hmm. So that was just, that was a comment. And my question is, um, it was a pretty straightforward question. Are all American Jews that? As I said, and as I said, this is a category. You know, one of the things which I started, my first published essay ever was on the definition of exiles. This was an essay that took me more than any other essay because to make a classical sort of like thinking to yourself, how do I define something? And then I read Karl Popper. Karl Popper has a whole chapter on definitions. Brilliant chapter. When he said in the modern era, we no longer define what he called essentialist definitions, a la Aristotle. What is a dog? A dog is da-da-da-da-da-da-da, also has a, uh, a tail and four legs and also bark, uh, and all the other attributes, the idea of the dog. He said, that's not a scientific definition. A scientific definition is not from left to right, but to right from left. I said, this is, and I will call it diaspora. And that's what I call the diaspora. Now, some people say diaspora is anyone who lives abroad, a dispersion, anyone who was kicked out, etc. It's not, I don't debate it. It's not a question of debate. For me, diaspora is people who define themselves or defined by others as members or potential members, etc., my definition. And they are mobilized. There are levels of diaspora that I identify early on. One which I call the core members. Those who are organizing, the organizers. They don't have to be many, but they are always organizers of this community. The second I call them the rear guard members, based on, and you, I, I once cast one of an old lady who wrote this book, on the Spanish and the Polish government in exile. I developed on hers. And these are people who are sometimes engaged, sometimes not engaged. And the third, which I, you know, like we can call it the Benedict Anderson sort of imagine community. You may call on them, but they may not be interested. But suddenly they will go to a rally. Are they diaspora? They consider themselves, their home country is important to them, only to a certain point. When they are mobilized, they are part of that. But obviously the politics, and remember politics we are talking about, I'm a political scientist after all, is always about the core member, those who are the activists. Very few can make lots of noise. Lenin knew about it. Organize your politics and you are in the game. Chalabi didn't have millions behind him, but Chalabi was very effective. You need to be incredibly effective by organization. Organization, connections, etc. That's a key factor in politics. And the diaspora. Now, some organizations don't have any members. When I went to study, I, I did a, a long study of Arabs and Muslims in America. I remember in this city when I came, I came at the time, I traveled from abroad. I was visiting the, uh, Arab, uh, the, the National Association of Arab Americans, which doesn't exist now. At that time, it was built along the lines of APAC, the American uh, 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 Jewish uh, major. Uh, 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 public uh, advocacy group. 
And, and I remember coming to their office, and there were 40 members, 40 people working, lots of faxes at the time, because there was not so much to email, but kind of like working very nicely in the early 90s. And then I came the next year to do kind of a pilot, and then the office was, was, office was closed. I said, wow, I couldn't find them, and I had to go to the third floor and find it. I didn't have a place even to hang my coat. I said, how many members do you have? The, the guy's name was Halil Jashan, the head of the group. He said, we have uh, three members. I said, who are the three? He said, uh, me and uh, this lady, and, uh, and he showed me the other secretary. I said, what happened to the group? He said, you know, the Saudis closed our, because when the world went democratic, we started to advocate democracy. He said, you're the democracy? Ma'asalami wa rahmatullah. They took the money and went. And they closed the organization. And I had interviews with National Association of America to see, because they didn't have constituency as members. So the organization didn't matter anymore. Some organizations do matter, some organizations don't matter. And that is essence. It doesn't mean that there are no Arabs in America and Palestinians and many in the diasporas. But how the group works is the organization. Who funded, to what extent there is a core group that is really well organized of essence of what's happening in organization politics. Um, so that is, this is very much when you say to me, are they really that, you know, I don't argue. It's not a question of fighting what else call it, you know, like uh, uh, some of my friends have two-page definitions. I don't like two-page definitions. I don't believe in two-page definitions. Because then you can add another point. And you can add two lines to that. So, so what? Does it make the phenomena more explainable? No. And indeed, one of the arguments I make is that this field has been not only developed, but become saturated and confused. Because lots of people ties kinship transnational ties into homeland related issues. Diasporas always have a homeland as a center. Transnational connection doesn't have to have a homeland. I don't consider Muslims in the world as a diaspora. They may tied as kin, as members of the religious community. They may mobilize as such, but they're not a diaspora. They are the transnational religious community. Because they don't have a one homeland as a target. They may have many, many homelands. A diaspora certainly has the tenet of a homeland. In the Jewish case, it was interesting to me because it was part also built into the religious belief. Only in Judaism there is a homeland which is a religious patrimony. Perhaps some told me it's in the Sikh religion also. And when I, when I went to Punjab, they told me, no, it's not the same. Only the Jews have a homeland built into the tenet of their belief. Every, every year, you say next year in Jerusalem, it's part and parcel. Of, of the belief. And that's what the connection of the Jewish religion, nationality, and, 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 and ethnicity was so tied. And that's why it's confusing matters. Yes, sir. Um, you talk about the power of the theory and um, you know, the power of diasporas in all these different ways. So I, I would ask you if you could debunk that myth that uh, Jews are on the world. How do you, how do you prove that, uh, how do you prove it isn't? I mean, See, just, I'm, not, I'm not about debunking myth. One of the, one of the greatest mistakes is you're being tackled, so debunk this. <laughs> I mean, I don't have to prove anything. <laughs> I don't have to prove If someone wants to prove something, they prove. Look, I know only one thing when I, I'm a student of that. That the myth of Jewish power was always there. In the eve of World War I. But I mean, you're, you, you called it a myth. So by, by doing that, you're... You're saying it's not so. I will tell you that they claim, okay? Call it if you want, real or imagined, okay? Mm -hmm. They claim, so to be more precise, mm -hmm. of Jewish power. You look at World War I, the Jews were perceived in many parts as incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. Everybody thought that they were controlling the world, the Rothschilds and everything, even though they had no patrimony, no sovereignty, and nothing. And eventually, you know, the powerlessness was well discovered in World War II. They were nothing. They were dead. And the big debate between the Zionists and the other organization was about to what extent you need territory and sovereignty to have power. Power and sovereignty, is, is that a necessity for, for power? In the post-Israeli state, when the state was created, there was a very, there was a very interesting phenomenon. Jewish power is now arguably, or in the, in the minds of some, is organized both in the state of Israel as a sovereign state, and in the power of the Jewish Americans organization that have tremendous clout in America. But that is a claim. You know, Mahathir Muhammad also said that the Jews have led to the decline of the, the, of, of the, of the, uh, 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 of, of the, his currency because of conspiracy in the international markets. You know, I don't have to debunk anything. So they said, so what? 
You know, there are lots of the, the claims of power have to be substantiated, not just declared. You know, and they have to be substantiated. That's my point. You don't, you know, to make the story of, of, of Jewish power is not a new story. It was, if you look at, if, if you look at, uh, what's his name, um, Gruen, Gruen's book, Diaspora meets Romans and, and the Hellenic. Jews were dispersed, exiled for 2,000 years. So some say they have power. So what? Anti-Semitism is a very well-known phenomenon also. The elders of Zion had a whole protocols written about it. And many have made lots of claims about this kind of power. At the same time, what I make the point, and I've written extensively about it in recent years, that there is also a Jewish propensity of fear, of, for good reason sometimes, what I call the Gewalt Syndrome, the Doomsday Scenario. And indeed, this, this world, you constantly move from the Doomsday Scenario to overwhelming power. How do you reconcile this? And indeed, which other country you have a Persian or Iranian leader who declares that this country should be abolished and destroyed and we're going to do it soon enough? Not uh, with impunity. This is a big issue in international affairs because the world has a shtick with the Jews, what they say in Yiddish, which means they have a case with the Jews, no doubt about it. Now, whether it's true, false, well, so what? That's the case. That's why there are paradigmatic cases around many things. It, it is a case, however, that you have to study it carefully to see what's really existing there. If you talk about the, the Walt in Milsheimer's book, it's a fascinating book because it has a thesis that the world is being led to catastrophe by the Jews. Why is that? Because American decision makers in Congress and in the White House are completely beholden to Jewish power. They live in a neo-Marxist world of what? Of self-delusion. When Rumsfeld, Cheney, Bush, Condi, everybody declaring the war, it's, they know that the war is against American national interest, but they cannot resist the Jews, even though the Jews don't vote for them. And you read it, and you read it, and you see one plot after the other, and you say, wow, quite amazing. Quite amazing. Now, I don't have explanations to make. I haven't seen any review. I, when I asked to review the book, I don't do it. I said, for, for the sake of polemics and making a bombshell and selling books, it's good. But I'm not going to get as a scholar to debate it. It's not for me to debate. It's everything I will say. They will say, you know, he's an Israeli, you know, so immediately I will be debunked myself. Why should I? So I deal with many other cases. I take it. I, I try to be really careful in what I do. That's the whole idea of scholarship. To really to be careful, try to make sense, to be careful. You know, we, we sit in academia. We don't sit just in the world of, 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 of rumors. And really what's happening there? It doesn't mean that we don't have attachment and someone cannot tell me, you know, he is writing because he's biased. You know, I declare where I stand. I don't, you know, but, but you know, when, when I stand, it doesn't mean that I am like a, 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 a trumping someone's card. Believe me, I remember one time I came to speak in Argentina. And I was invited to speak in Buenos Aires to Jewish teachers. And remember, this was after the AMIA bombing. Amia is like the Jewish center in Argentina, and because the Hezbollah conflict with Israel, the Argentinian center was bombed, 100 Jews were killed there. It was a disaster in the 1990s. And I came, I was invited to speak as a scholar to the Council of Foreign Relations. And the Israeli ambassador at the time, in Argentina, because the Argentinian community was so rattled, takes me to the side, kind of, and said, you know, we shouldn't speak about such and such issues. And I stood in the point and I said, Mr. Ambassador, you are being paid to say what the Israeli government tell you, I am being paid to say whatever I want. That's the academic freedom I have. <laughs> and it was shocked goodbye. I, you know, I, anyone can say whatever they want. But the question is whether you say substantially, making a point, being carefully theoretically with the evidence, uh, and, and that's the big issue. And, you know, we are in the free world. We don't, uh, but we are allowed to debate these issues. It's not to try to say, so how do you explain that there is not? This is not a good question for me. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Could you uh, elaborate on the concept of a homeland? Um, the Jewish uh, movement, uh, Zionist movement, started to get organized and established the first Zionist uh, Congress in Basel in 1897. Yes. Following the pogroms in Eastern Europe. Uh, there are movements of a uh, faction of people that favored uh, Uganda. You mentioned Argentina, the Baron here. Sure. Favored Argentina. It was not necessarily uh, Churchill had to raise his right hand yes. and said, my right hand will wither yeah. if I forget Jerusalem and all this and that. So, so I'm from Israel too much. But, but yes. anyway, so is this 
the cops of my homeland. Does it have to be Israel? Look, the Zionist movement grew up out of the nationalist movement of the 19th century in Europe. The only what, what happened is, and, and I don't want to get into Zionist history, but it was a clear, it was emancipation. The French allowed emancipation, the German, etc. But the Zionists made the point that notwithstanding emancipation, we cannot find ourselves as full citizens in Europe. Herzl writes in the Jewish state that the greatest solution for him as a humanist would have been assimilation if we were allowed. But we were not allowed. The Dreyfus trial. And the Dreyfus trial, of course, awakened him. So the Zionist movement, as a secularist movement of modernity, which took on other issues, issues of renaissance of the individual with the socialist notion of working and toiling the land, of migration to the, did not come with the notion first of a religious idea. This was later on because there was also a religious school, but came with the idea that first of all, if you read Herzl's notion of the Jewish state, half of the book is about the transfer of people from one place to another. How do we do it practically? Because why? Because all the other nationalities in Europe had a homeland in their countries of domicile. They may have been granted uh, 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 independence or not by the empires, the collapsing empire, but the Jews could not claim any territory in Europe as theirs. And therefore they had to move into another place to create a sovereign nation state. That was the case for the Zionists. Now, initially the question was where it will be. And indeed, as you suggested, some will say, you know, it may be in Argentina, some will say it will be the Uganda plan, etc., etc., if we cannot move to Palestine. Uh, but that was very quickly uh, pushed aside, as you know, and I don't want to dwell on Zionist history. But the homeland concept was very much later on, because like any state, states are in the modern era are nation states, which means they do not just consider themselves as carriers of rights in the liberal sense, that we just protect the rights. They want to see there is also something meaningful about them as such. And membership is not just membership for the sake of protecting rights, but membership for protecting the collectivity as such, even in liberal states. Therefore, the idea of a patrie is, is good even for liberalism. I remember in, 19, in 2001, what's the guy's name? I forget his name. Uh, a scholar, the AI, wrote this book on, on American patriotism. How American patriotism declined. And, and it's over, and, and, and Francis Fukuyama gave a talk, I remember C-SPAN recording it, and lo and behold, 2001 came, and all America was filled with, with flags, and, and was patriotism, awakened patriotism. The patri notion of the collectivity is part and parcel of that. And indeed, as the state, or the, the movement of nationalism emerging, there was a big question, what will build this notion of the homeland? For the socialist Zionists, the homeland was the recovery of the land. They became workers. They became laborers. They wanted to recover. They bought land, land and work it. We have to show it's like, it was kind of like the catharsis of the socialist, the home of favor, the man who creates through his labor for them. For the, for the liberals, there was not the issue, as many of them were came. And for the religious people, those who were bent on, on, on nationalism, there was, of course, the recovery of the land because of a sign from God. But there was also the ultra-Orthodox, for whom the modern Zionists was predating the arrival of the Messiah, and they considered the whole experience as absolutely hijacking Judaism. And there were, of course, the Buddhists, who were cultural Zionists who wanted to create only culture in Europe, etc. These were the debates, fascinating debates. And they relate to what? To the place where the issue was raised. In America, you had American Zionists, the Supreme Court Judge Brandeis which I talked about, who, about whom I talk about in my book. And how America brand of Zionism was created, that this is the homeland, America. And therefore, we can be Zionists and supporting Israel like all other ethnic groups in America who can support their countries of origin. And when Israel was established, and Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, debunked the exilic notion of those who live abroad. There are people who are not yet move, make the move. And indeed, Israelis who lived abroad for many years were perceived by Israelis as people who are doing Yerida, is, are, are going down, down from the state, which is mentally down, physically down, and emotionally down. They are less worthy. But yet, when Ben-Gurion declared the, all the Jews outside the state of Israel as exilic or diaspora, he did not dare to call so to the American people. Because Jacob Blaustein, the head of the American Jewish Committee, came to Ben-Gurion and said to him, America is our homeland. 
don't mess around. And if you look at the Israel Foreign Ministry, there are two categories. The Jewry abroad, which lives in the diaspora, and American Jews. Walter Eitan, at the time the Director General of the Foreign Ministry, has this in his, in his writings. Because American Jews have a homeland. But it doesn't preclude them from having affinity to the countries of origin or symbolic homeland or to the kin. And that's why this kind of, it's an interesting case for me to compare to many others. I deal with the Indians and I deal with the Mex, I deal with many others. Or with the Armenians, lots of, you will read lots about Armenians here. But these are very interesting cases to see how they, they are compared about the conception of the homeland. Yes, ma'am. I think we're going to have to limit it just to one more you, question. You dictate. Yeah, one more question. Okay. Um, how do you see the nation state evolving as more people, as it becomes easier for people in diaspora to connect outside of the state itself? One of the, the first chapter in the book, and uh, I'll read you just what, what it says, so you will see what I, it's, it's all about the genealogy of the nation state and its vagaries. And I write like this. At the center of the national idea is the belief that people with distinct character should possess their own territory. Thus, over time, a world consisting of independent nation states should, by definition, obviate such phenomena as separatist movement and diasporas. In this sense, both diasporic existence and secessionist claims are what might be termed counter-theoretical concepts, inconsistent with the structural rationale of the global system. Yet, in reality, the opposite is true. Now, go explain. Supposedly, if everybody lives in their country, no diasporas. I belong to country X, you belong to country Y, the division of humanity according to nation state. And yet, what I show in this chapter, that in fact the nation state had the completely opposite propensity. The more nation state you create, the more you get claims of, of, of secessionism, and the more you get claims for, uh, of diaspora for a variety of reasons. And that's what I call the theoretical failure of the nation state. And I'm trying, and I explain why it is, and what are the repercussions of that. I'm done? All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, if you want to uh, stay and enjoy some food, we have some food and drinks.